Good evening. I'm John Meekham, I'm the Executive Director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you and thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, this program tonight is the fourth of this year's Jack M. Templeton Liberty Series programs. The final program uh, will be on March 2nd with uh, John Stossel. Um, and tonight's program is presented by the Union League Legacy Foundation. The Legacy Foundation is the charity, the nonprofit charity of the Union League of Philadelphia, and we use the values, the spirit, the collections, uh, the history of this great institution for all kinds of programs about the Constitution, civics, uh, about being a good citizen with Good Citizen Day, uh, programs that reach thousands of members and more importantly our community, and they're all about making better citizen leaders in our community and nation. So I thank you for being here this evening. I hope you'll attend more of our programs. Um, our programs are not funded. Uh, through the Union League directly. We're th funded through voluntary contributions from Union League members, mostly Union League members. And I know most of you here are uh, donors to the Legacy Foundation, and we appreciate that. And if you're not, I hope you will join the many and the growing number who are supporting the work of, of this great charity of the Union League. Um, we are suggesting, we're making a suggestion, uh, that if you are not a donor, that you make a suggested donation tonight of $25 for this great program. Better yet, Become a Pepper patron, our new Pepper patron, which is a $300 level. There's all kinds of benefits associated with that. Um, and our, our crack staff back here, Amanda and Kira, would be happy to tell you more about that after the program. So please see them uh, after the program if you are not yet a donor. And if you are, again, thank you for your support. The Jack Templeton Liberty Series was named in honor of Jack Templeton, of course, by his wife, Pina Templeton. And Jack passed in 2015, and Pina we just lost Pina this past fall. And since the series began, I believe it was 2017, we've had a program each day on February 19th, because today is Jack's birthday. In fact, Jack would have been 80 today. Uh, and we celebrate his birthday in the ways in which Jack would have loved. And one is that we break bread with one of Jack's favorite food groups, <laughs> peanut chews. So, Grab some peanut chews on your way out if you haven't had them, and remember Jack. Um, but more importantly, we present Jack's, Jack's favorite sport, which is a program like tonight, discussion, debate. Um, he was dedicated to learning, uh, to challenging his own thoughts, to challenging his own ideas. And that's what we have tonight. We have a, a, a great program that's gonna be filled with intellect, with candor, and with goodwill and Jack would have loved it, and I'm sure he's loving it where he is now. Um, so I wanna take a moment tonight to thank and acknowledge one of Jack and Pina's daughters who is here with us tonight. She probably doesn't want me to do this, but uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Simpson, where is Jennifer? <laughs> thank you, Jennifer, thanks for being here. And now a few housekeeping items. Um, please silence your cell phones, and I'm just gonna stop for a moment while you all do that. There will be a Q&A uh, following the program tonight, which is gonna be a moderated discussion. The questions will be taken from the note cards. There should be plenty of them in, your, uh, in the aisles. Um, Kira, Amanda, Joe, other members of staff will pick them up, and then we will uh, be able to read a few of them during the Q&A. And finally, there are books um, uh, by both uh, Mitch Berman and Randy Barnett uh, back in the back there with Kelly uh, in the back left over there. Uh, and please, grab your book on the way out. Grab one for uh, Mitch, grab one for Randy. Uh, read them, uh, give them notes, email them, and learn more. And then decide for yourself uh, what you think about their arguments. So, and finally, it's my pleasure to introduce the chair of the Union League Legacy Foundation, my boss, Ms. Joan Carter. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our moderator, Michael Moreland, and he already told me I'm supposed to keep this very short, so I'm going to do my best. Uh, he is, Dr. Moreland is Professor of Law and Religion at Villanova. He's director of the McCullen Center for Law, Religion, and Public Policy, and a renowned scholar of constitutional law in his own right. 
uh, with a focus on torts, bioethics, and religious freedom. Uh, he's a frequent commentator at national and international conferences in the media and uh, has testified before Congress, uh, published articles in leading and public policy journals. He, before his uh, gig at, at Villanova, which is where he is now, he was at Princeton University, Notre Dame, and James Madison Universities. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree in philosophy from Notre Dame and his MA and PhD from Boston College, JD from University of Michigan. He clerked for uh, Paul J. Kelly of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals and served in the White House under George W. Bush. So that's all of the credentials. Now you know all of that stuff. What I'm here to tell you is that uh, Michael has been a great friend uh, of the Union League and particularly the Legacy Foundation. He was on the board of the Abraham Lincoln Foundation uh, and has moderated two prior Liberty Series events, including uh, Judge Samuel Alito, the honorable, I guess I should say, uh, Samuel Alito when he was here in 1917. He is one of the constitutional scholars and uh, is a regular for Good Citizens Day and has provided valuable insights and leadership for those of us in the Legacy Foundation, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome, Michael Moreland. Thank you, Joan, for those kind words. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'll introduce our uh, two participants uh, now, and then we'll come up here and have a, a moderated discussion. Randy Barnett is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at the Georgetown University Law Center, where he directs the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. After graduating from Northwestern University and Harvard Law School, he was a criminal prosecutor in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office in Chicago. Is there a crime in Chicago? I didn't know. Um, <laughs> a recipient of a Guggenheim uh, Fellowship and a Bradley Prize, Barnett has been a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, Northwestern, and here at Penn. He argued the medical marijuana case, Gonzalez versus Raich, in the U.S. Supreme Court, and was a lawyer for the National Federation of Independent Businesses in its constitutional challenge to the Affordable Care Act. He has published 11 books and over 100 articles and reviews. His latest book and video series is an introduction to uh, constitutional law, 100 Supreme Court Cases Everyone Should Know, co-authored with Josh Blackman. And that's actually the book that is available in the back of the room. Randy will say a little bit about it at the end of our program today. Mitchell Berman is the Leon Meltzer Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania Carey Law School. He teaches and writes in diverse areas of legal theory, specializing in criminal law, constitutional law, and a new domain of scholarly inquiry he has dubbed the jurisprudence of sport. Uh, before joining Penn, uh, Mitch was the Richard Dale Endowed Chair in Law and Professor of Philosophy and co-director of the Law and Philosophy Program at the University of Texas. He has been a visiting professor of law at the University of Michigan and the University of Chicago. He's a graduate of Harvard and uh, Michigan Law School, go blue, uh, and he is also the co-author of dozens of articles and book chapters, including one that is available, again, at the back of the room. So I'd invite Randy and Mitch to come up, and we'll begin our program. As those of you who were here for the event with Justice Lito know, my job is to uh, let these guys talk, not to, not to participate much myself. So we'll start off with some opening statements uh, from each of them about our question for this evening, which is broadly, how should the U.S. Constitution be interpreted in an originalist or a non-originalist fashion? Then I'll uh, ask them each some uh, follow-up questions, and then as John Miko mentioned, we'll have about 15 minutes or so at the end for your questions that you will deliver up on your note cards. So we'll begin with Randy Barnett, who will talk about how he thinks the Constitution should be interpreted. All right, well, thank you, Michael, and thank you to the Union League Club and the Foundation. For, they're they're going to kick me out any second, I know that. Yeah. 
Now am I on? Am I on now? Okay. He had a uh, equipment malfunction, as they say at the Super Bowl. All right, so. Um, Anyway, um, we're, we're here to talk about how the Constitution should be, interpreted, should be interpreted. I'm the originalist on the program. Uh, Mitch is the living constitutionalist on the program. And so I'm here to tell you what originalism is in eight minutes or less, uh, and in a way that everybody can understand. So that's my challenge. And here is how I hope to meet it. I'm going to give you a definition of originalism in one sentence. And then I'm going to explain it. But I'm gonna, it's originalism in one sentence. And that is this. I have a copy of the Constitution here. This is it. And that is, the meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. That's originalism. Let me say that again. The meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. That's it. That's it. That's the whole thing. It's really not much more complicated than that. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. But it, it, <laughs> so let me now unpack that a little bit. That, that, if you just get that, walk away, that's what you got. Um, you've, you've, that's, you've got originalism for this. You've, you've already earned your uh, degree from this program today, tonight. Uh, but let me just unpack this a little bit. So originalism, essentially, what I just said, actually, has two claims, makes two claims. One is that there is a meaning that is fixed at the time it's enacted. That's the, first, that's the first claim, that there is a meaning. And secondly, that it should not be changed, except by amendment. It should not be changed. It can only, should only be properly changed. And so the first is a descriptive claim. It's a claim about meaning. It's a claim about the fact that documents have meanings, and these meanings are typically ascertainable. You can discover what they are, um, and that this document had a meaning at the time it was enacted. And it, and it was enacted over periods of time. There's amendments, they had meetings when they were enacted. It hasn't all been enacted all, all at once. It took place in stages. Um, so does that thesis make sense, that the document had a meaning when it was enacted? Does that make sense? I think it makes sense. Um, if you were to read a letter that was written in 1789 and you wanted to know what that letter meant, you wouldn't read that letter, you, you wouldn't be reading that letter accurately if you use definitions of words as they exist today, if that definition has changed over time. I mean, most of the words haven't changed over time, but if that should have changed over time, you'd be reading it inaccurately if you attributed today's meaning to that letter. So for example, if somebody in a letter in 1789 was discussing the problem of domestic violence, what would that person be talking about? Would that person be talking about spouse abuse? because that's what domestic violence means today to most people. It means spouse abuse. Well, the answer is that's what it means today, but at the time this Constitution was enacted, domestic violence referred to uh, civil unrest, civil, civil violence, uh, insurrections of those kinds. That was domestic violence. Uh, it wasn't spouse abuse. So if a letter referred to domestic violence, you'd be reading it accurately if you would think that letter was about uh, uh, spouse abuse. Um, in fact, the Constitution does refer to domestic violence. It basically gives uh, uh, the federal government the power to uh, call out the militia to assist um, uh, if a state is suffering from domestic violence. Um, and when, the, and when it, the Constitution uses the word domestic violence, to read it accurately, you would read it as, it was, as, as that meaning was fixed at the time the Constitution was enacted to mean insurrections. You would not think that that was a domestic violence meaning spouse abuse clause. So that's the, first, that's the first thing I'm going to say about what's sometimes called the fixation thesis, that the meaning of the Constitution is fixed at the time it's enacted. Um, Mitch may have a lot more to say about that, but that, that's, that's what I'll have to say for now. Uh, the now, the second claim is not descriptive. That's descriptive. I mean, for example, the, the, con the, the Confederate Constitution, if you want to read the Confederate Constitution, Constitution of the Confederacy of the United States. How, would, you, how it, would, would did that Constitution have a meaning when it was enacted? Of course it did. And if you want to read that Constitution accurately, you would give it the meaning it had um, in the 1860s when it was enacted. Even though it is not the law that, that, we, that we adhere to today, that's how you'd read the document if you want to know what it, what it means. So the second, the second claim of originalism is that the meaning of the Constitution ought to remain the same until it's properly changed, which means all the constitutional actors 
um, who are to be govern or who are to follow the Constitution need to follow that original meaning. Now, uh, we don't follow the meaning of the Confederate Constitution because it's not our it's not the law, but this Constitution is still in effect, and so there's a there's a there is a normative claim that this is the Constitution that ought to be followed until it's properly changed. This is the one I'm holding in my hand now. What is the argument, what's the normative argument to be made on this behalf? Well, I'm gonna make a simple, straightforward one, then I'm gonna make a little more elaborate one, and that should use up my eight minutes. So the simple, straightforward one is to say that this Constitution is not the law that governs us. This is not the law that governs us. This is the law that governs those who govern us. This is the law that governs those who govern us. They then make laws that govern us, that do apply to us. And so the idea here is that those who are to be governed by this law should no more be able to change it without going through the appropriate amendment process than we can change the laws that they make to govern us without going through the appropriate legislative process. So they make the speed limits, we have to follow them, we don't have living speed limits in which we adjust them according to our particular perception as to whether they're a good idea or a bad idea. If we think a speed limit is set too low, we have to go through a big administrative process to get that speed limit changed. Um, and the same thing is true of the, of the people who govern us. And not only that, but here's another normative claim, another normative uh, a part of the claim. And that is those how, who are to be governed by this constitution, let me, let me stop for a second. We, no one here in this room ever consents to be bound by this Constitution. I know there's arguments about tacit consent. No one, no one ever asked you, anybody in this room, well, some of you actually in this room probably were asked, but that's getting to my second point. <laughs> Generally speaking, as citizens, you're not asked to follow this Constitution. But each and every person who receives power over us as a result of this document has to swear an oath committing him or herself morally to following what's in this document. And that oath would mean nothing. It would simply be meaningless in a literal sense if what that oath was to was whatever the government official thought this ought to say, as opposed to what it actually does say. That oath would mean nothing if the, if the people who are to be bound by it can change it according to what they think would be a better idea to make the world a better place. Then what are they taking an oath to? They take an oath to, the actual literal meaning, words of their oath is, they take an oath to this Constitution, meaning the written one, the one I'm holding in my hand. That meaning, the, the, the Constitution that had a meaning that was fixed at the time it was enacted. So the reason why this Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed is because it's the law that governs those who govern us, and those who are to govern us took an individual personalized oath to follow that Constitution whose meaning is independent of their own will or preference or desires. Now, that's the normative argument. Now, I'll give another normative argument because there's more to it than what I've just said. I could say that about almost any Constitution, but now I want to say something special about this Constitution, the one we've got, and that is this Constitution is a means to an end. And then the question is, what is the end? Well, the end is not a matter of opinion. Uh, the end was, uh, was officially adopted by the United States, and it was adopted in a document called the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence was the form formally adopted unanimously by every state that was then in the Union. And in that declaration, in the first paragraph of that declaration, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You all know this. But then the next sentence is what states the political theory of the United States. And the next sentence says, to secure these rights, which rights? The rights in the previous sentence, what kind of rights are they? Individual rights, which individual rights? The unalienable or natural individual rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, now let me say that again. To secure those rights, these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That, in two sentences, is the, political, is the political theory of the United States. After the Declaration was adopted, then the United States had two cracks at government, first under the Articles of Confederation, then under this Constitution. Many people, not everybody, but many people thought the Articles were not working, 
As a result, they thought they needed to be replaced. They were replaced by this. This Constitution is the means. The end is stated by the Declaration of Independence, and that is to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Which rights? The rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So then the question is, is this document, if followed, if it's actually followed, a useful, efficient, good enough means of securing the individual rights of we the people? The individual rights retained by we the people, which is how the Ninth Amendment refers to these rights, the rights retained by the people. Is it, are the mechanisms contained in this document effective, efficient enough to actually provide a protection of those individual rights when the people who get power under this Constitution use that power to govern us? And the answer I would give to this is a qualified yes. That is, I think on balance, if this Constitution as amended, and I only defend the Constitution as amended, I don't defend the original Constitution. That's not the Constitution in effect. We have amendments. We have the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment. The people that founded this club know a lot about those amendments. The Union League Club know a lot about how those amendments came about. That's the Constitution I defend. And my position is, and I could be wrong about this, but my position is that if the procedures that, were, that are described in this document, the original meaning of these procedures are actually followed by those who have power under it, then that will effectively protect us, the rights retained by the people, and give rise to a moral duty to obey the law. Uh, but that's another claim that is true and could be contested. But at this, I think at that point, I think I'll just rest my case. That's the case for uh, originalism. <clears throat> and now Mitch, Mitch Berman will present the alternative. Well, thanks so much. First, I just want to thank uh, all of you for being here. I want to thank the Union League Legacy Foundation for putting this on and for inviting me, Michael for inviting me, and of course, Randy, it's always a pleasure to see and engage with Randy. I'm going to do three things in my remarks. First, I'm going to quibble a little bit with Randy's definition of originalism. Second, I'm going to cause a little trouble for originalism. Uh, far, far short of any sort of disproof, my ambitions here are more modest. I'm going to cause some trouble. My guess, and I've been told by various people here to expect this, that many people in the audience might come somewhat predisposed in favor of originalism. I don't know if that's your view or not. But, <laughs> so I'm just going to try to push you off a little bit and say maybe it's not quite as obvious as you think, and then I'm going to offer an alternative. OK, so first, what is originalism? Randy said originalism has a descriptive thesis. That is the view that uh, the Constitution has a meaning, and that meaning is fixed. We're not here, I don't think, ultimately to talk about meanings, though. We're here to talk about law. That's ultimately what this story is about. The question is, what is the law? What is the constitutional law, not what is the meaning of the text? Now, those two things would be the same if it were the case that the law around here, the constitutional law rightly understood, was fully determined or constituted by the meaning of the text. So the best way, I think the most felicitous and perspicuous way to understand what originalism is, a way to understand originalism so that there's a real debate between originalists and non-originalists, is as a theory about what our law is. And the claim, I think, is that the constitutional law rightly understood is the meaning of the text, and that meaning is fixed. Uh, so that's what I'm going to take originalism to be. Not merely a thesis about what the text means, but a thesis about the law to which the text gives rise. I take that to be a friendly quibble to Randy's initial statement about what originalism is. So that's the thesis. Now here's the next thing to say about that thesis. Gosh, that's an intuitive thesis. I certainly think you guys, when first hearing it, you think, yeah, that makes sense. We've got a legal system. We've got an authoritative legal text. What would be the law but for the meaning of the text? Highly, highly intuitive. I grant you that entirely. But not all highly intuitive theses are correct. Here's one. It's highly, highly intuitive that heavy bodies fall faster than lighter bodies of the same size. Aristotle thought so. He was a smart guy. In fact, if you went outside on Broad Street right now and pulled passers-by, I bet you dollars to donuts that the majority would say the same thing. Galileo showed that that was wrong. Actually, uh, heavier bodies don't fall faster than lighter bodies do. 
a surprising finding because the contrary thesis is highly intuitive. Now, does that establish that the originalist thesis is wrong? Not at all. All I'm saying is that the admitted high intuitiveness of that thesis is no great warrant of the truth of it. Now, is it nonetheless true that the law around here, the constitutional law rightly understood, is fully constituted, fully determined by the meaning of the text? Well, it could be. If it were the case, it could be the case in either of two ways. This is now when I'm causing a little trouble for originalism. It could be the case that that's true about our constitutional order because it is true of legal systems always and all places. It is a general truth about legal systems that when they have an authoritative legal text, the law to which they give rise is the meaning of the text. If that were true, then the truth of originalism as applied to our constitutional order would follow necessarily from what we philosophers of law call a general jurisprudential truth, the general truth about law as such. But that is not a general truth about law as such. Legal systems across time and place have very often treated the law to be something other than the meaning of the text. I will give you three ways very quickly without giving examples. We can talk about examples during question and answer or discussion. But three ways in which legal elites and legal communities have thought that actually the law of that system is non-identical to the fixed meaning of the text. One way is when the meaning seems to depart from the intentions of the authors. Sometimes authors misspeak. Sometimes they put something down which on reflection they realize doesn't really capture what they intended. And legal systems often uh, treat the intentions of the authors and ratifiers, as it were, as privileged over the meaning of the text. A good example, by the way, uh, is the pine tar game in baseball. Uh, it was mentioned, Michael mentioned, I do teach the philosophy of sport. Uh, a second way in which legal elites in various different legal communities... What, what is the pine tar game? Well, it's not, we can talk, I don't want to use up my time on that. So I just don't know what if, it is. If you, if you doubt that claim, I'm happy to talk about it, but I think many of you will be able to draw up to yourself examples from legal systems in which actually the intention of the authors is privileged over the meaning. Here's another way. Sometimes stable practices over time depart from the meaning and the intentions, and the legal elites of a legal system treat that the practices as they have arisen as privileged over the meanings encoded in the text. That is a very common phenomenon. That is, was a fundamental element of Roman law. A third way in which sometimes in legal communities uh, the legal elites treat the law as non-identical to the meaning of the text is when the law or the meaning of the text is understood by the community to uh, depart from widely shared commitments of justice. Uh, my example there, if you care to hear it during question and answer, would be a lovely example from the Deuteronomic Code, but I can give other examples as well. The key point is just, I hope you can take my word for it, uh, at least provisionally, that it is not a general truth about law, that the law must always be all and only what the text means. Intentions, practices, justice, among other things, are other determinants of the law which sometimes trump or are privileged over the meaning of the text. That being true, it nonetheless could be the case that around here, as part of our constitutional order, it is true that our law is fully determined by or constituted by or made out by what the text means. That could be true. And I, of course, cannot disprove that in the few minutes allotted me. I'm just going to give a few examples that might cause some of you to doubt the truth of that proposition. Here are a few. Most people in this culture, in the legal culture and the non-legal culture, believe that Congress could not, make it a could not make blasphemy a crime or could not make it a crime to falsely criticize the government. The courts have held that, and just about everyone believes that those are correct holdings. Nonetheless, historians believe that that is not the correct understanding of the original meaning of our First Amendment. Point one. Another example. Most people around here, broadly speaking, believe that states could not establish churches. The state of Pennsylvania could not say, you know, the Society of Friends, that's a good religious outfit. We're going to support them with tax dollars. However, everybody agrees that the original understanding of the First Amendment Established Clause was limited to prohibiting the national establishment of religion, and most historians believe that the 14th Amendment original meaning did not change that. 
the Justice Clarence Thomas believes that those things are true, and therefore he believes that actually states could establish religions. That is a strikingly heterodox view. Other examples, most people believe that the federal government is bound by equality type constraints roughly similar to the types of equality based constraints that bind the states. However, the uh, Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment very clearly and explicitly only binds the states and there is no roughly equivalent proposition or uh, provision of the federal constitution that provides or creates an equality clause against the federal government. I could go on and on. I'll just give you one little one. Everybody believes that federal criminal defendants could waive their right to a jury trial. It happens every day. However, Article 3 of the Constitution says uh, all criminal trials, except in cases of impeachment, shall be tried by a jury. Not at the defendant's option. No option of the defendant to waive that and be tried by a judge. But our practice has been for a very long time that they could waive that. Those are just a few examples, and I could give a longer list as long as my arm, of other what I call originalism challengers, just the sort of thing to unsettle one's commitment to the idea that necessarily our law is fully determined by what the text means. Okay, so if originalism isn't true, and I don't claim for a moment that I've disproven it, but if I've given us a little argumentative space, what is the right account? Well, the right account is what I call plural, or organic pluralism. Okay, I'm probably not going to make a lot of money selling that account, but <laughs> or, organic pluralism, and it has two basic elements. The first is pluralism, that the fundamental elements, the fundamental determinants of our constitutional law are plural, not singular. Originalism is a monistic or singular thesis. The law is fully made out by one thing, the meaning of the text. My view is that the law is made out by a whole multiplicity of things. The analogy here is to practical reasoning. So I'll give you an example. Many of my students are now deciding what job to take, what profession to pursue. If they're not deciding it right now, they will be shortly. In making this decision, nobody takes one thing to matter most. They don't just say, well, here's the only thing that matters, where am I going to get the most money, or where am I going to have to work the least? There are a whole bunch of considerations that we always rely upon in our practical reasoning. Money, stability, what's going to contribute to the public good, what's going to be intellectually challenging, location, nice people to work with, so on and so forth. That's how practical reasoning works. We think that the thing one ought to do, all things considered, is a complex function of a plurality of underlying factors, <coughs> not a single function from a single factor to the all things considered ought. Law is just like that, and our constitutional order is, all, is just like that where the law is a complex function of a whole multiplicity of determinants, which conventionally are termed principles. So some of the principles of our order are things like this. Principles of federalism, principles of separation of power, principles of individual liberty, principles of the text mattering, principles of original intentions matter, principles of human dignity, principles of the dignity of states, and so on and so forth. These are the things that are run shot through uh, judicial opinions, and they are the basic fundamentals that, legal, that lawyers work with, basic principles. So there are a plurality of principles. Where, you might ask, do these principles come from? Well, these principles come from the very same place that all social phenomena come from, the thoughts and behaviors and speech acts of people. So I look out and I see, my goodness, what a fashionable crowd. What makes it the case that you're fashionable? Well, fashion is just a matter of what people take fashionable to be, what people wear, what they think others should wear, what words we use, what makes it the case that dog means, well, a dog, just because we have, through our practices, assigned that meaning to that particular uh, sound and those particular letters. Uh, the norms of sports and games, etc. what makes it the case that they are what they are? In philosophical terminology, if you'll excuse the jargon, they are what they are in virtue of underlying social facts, the facts about practices. Last thing I'll say, and I appreciate your patience, I'm sorry for going on uh, longer. If that's true, the following truth also follows. The, print, the law, legal rights, duties, powers, permissions, are a complex function of our constitutional principles. And our constitutional principles are what they are in virtue of the acts of mostly legal elites, especially but not uniquely judges. 
The final thing that follows is that the principles change over time because they are, metaphorically speaking, riding on top of the behaviors of people in just the same way that their norms of fashion and word meanings change over time. Inescapably, there is no force in nature that can prevent things from changing. That's why even though you're fashionable today, what you're wearing now would not have been fashionable 200 years ago and won't be fashionable 50 years from now because the, ultimate, the underlying social facts change organically, therefore the principles change organically, and therefore the law changes with it. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mitch. <clears throat> so we'll uh, have a few kind of rapid answer uh, rounds if we could, uh, and, then, and then have some Q&A. So back to you, Randy. What would you say, having heard Mitch's presentation, what's the nub of the disagreement? Like, what's the central question that the answer to which would help people think about which side of this debate is right? Okay, I'm going to try to take that out. I have to say, Mitch and I have known each other for a long time. We get along very well. We've been in many very collegial cir circumstances before, and I've heard him make his law argument many times, and I have to confess, I always have a hard time understanding what the heck he's talking about. <laughs> but, but, this was the clearest uh, presentation of his thesis that I've ever heard, and he's to be commended for that. So I think I finally, I think I finally am getting it a little bit there, Mitch. So, um, and so here's where, and, and, and this is, and I think I can say what the nub was based on this very clear presentation of his view. And that is when he stated, and in, in, he started off by saying, the question is, is the law fully constituted by the text? That's how he said at the beginning. And then he said variations on he that. Said by through, the meaning of the text. By the meaning of the text, sorry. Is the law fully constituted by the meaning of the text? And he said that in different ways, repeatedly. Then he gave examples of how the law was not fully constituted by the meaning of the text. All right, well, you'll notice I never claimed that all of our constitutional law is fully constituted by the text of the Constitution. So he actually is refuting a claim that I never made. What, the claim I made was that legal decision makers ought to be constrained by the meaning of the text. That's not the same as saying everything that comes out as law in one way or another is determined by what's in this document. It's a very little document. It doesn't provide all the law that there is. And in fact, there is this book you're going to get. I, I, was, I'm gonna, I was gonna promote the book at the end, but now is the time to do it. Because <laughs> there is a book you're going to get that was, uh, everyone's gonna get a free copy of this book. And, in, and also it, it gives you an option, uh, 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 access to a 63 video series. And the title of this book is An Introduction to Constitutional Law. And this is the book that will give you a pretty uh, comprehensive understanding of what our constitutional law is and how it came to be with these 100 Supreme Court cases. That's what we're teaching. This is not a book about the original meaning of the Constitution. This is not a book about why you should follow the original meaning of the Constitution. This is a book about the constitutional law that has been made by our Supreme Court. Now, oftentimes, the law that they've made is consistent with what the Constitution says, and therefore they're operating within the constraints provided by the original meaning of the Constitution. But oftentimes it is not. Oftentimes they have deviated from what the original meaning of the Constitution says. Um, and in that case, the, 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 the nub of the dispute, the nub of the debate between us is, is that okay or not? Is it okay for them to have deviated when, sometimes they might have done it just by innocent mistake, uh, but sometimes they might have done it because they were not satisfied. They didn't, they didn't like what the, the meaning of this document. They didn't like what was in here. And there were very, very prominent presidents and politicians like Woodrow Wilson who really detested uh, what was in this document. He just thought it was a terrible document. Um, uh, and, uh, and there were many people who, uh, progressives who agreed with him about that. They called it a horse and buggy constitution. They had a lot of bad names for this. And they said that we really need to grow out of this constitution. We need a better one. So the question is, when the Supreme Court has deviated from the constitution, is that something to be accepted 
and, and, and gratefully, because now they've made the world a better place? Or is it something wrong with that? And the thesis of originalism is that there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with one of the parties who are bound, who take an oath to this Constitution, deciding to improve upon it with their own ideas and their own practices. Now, have they done that? Have they made changes? Maybe some of them could be conceivably for the better. I'm not saying they're not all for the, they're not all for the worse. I can't say that. Um, sure, they've done that. And so in that sense, I don't think that Mitch and I have really uh, uh, disagreed about that much. Uh, the dis what we, we might disagree about whether it's been good or bad from what the Supreme Court has done. He's given a lot of examples that he tried to plant seeds of doubt as to whether what was good or what was bad. The only way we could get into that is by talking about each individual example, you know, whether he's right in what he says about those examples, whether there are other text parts of the Constitution that would actually provide better answers than the ones the Supreme Court has used. We can't do that tonight. We're not going to do that tonight. But I'm just suggesting that the thesis that he has rebutted is not the thesis that I made. And the thesis that I made, I think, still stands. Uh, and that, because he hasn't given you any real reason to think, to say, I think he has, maybe he has, any, but you'll know if you're the audience. Um, uh, has he given you a reason to think that the, the judges who, in particular, who are there to enforce this Constitution and who took an oath to enforce and protect this Constitution, they ought to be able, they ought to be able to improve upon it by changing the meaning to something that they and others people like them think are better. Has he given you an argument why that's true? And if he hasn't, then I think uh, at this point, my argument that they took an oath to the, do so, and, it, and actually the substance of this Constitution, if it were followed, would lead to, a good, would lead to good results. That, I think that argument still stands. I haven't given you an argument for the claim that Randy just put forth, because that's not my claim. I'm not relying upon the fact that Supreme Court precedents could get the law wrong, but under our system, sometimes we follow wrong precedents. My point is that sometimes they get the law right, even though uh, their decisions in for, uh, announcing what they take to be the law is not uh, what the original meaning was. So for example, I take it that most people think Loving versus Virginia was rightly decided, uh, a case that held to simplify that states could not criminalize interracial marriage. And that is true notwithstanding a deep historical d dive into exactly what was meant by equal protection in the, 18, in the, in the 19th century. Uh, historians debate this. The dominant view, I think, is certainly that doesn't violate the Equal Protection Clause. You know, It would if a white member to an interracial inter, uh, marriage were punished less severely than the non-white member. But otherwise, it's giving equal protection to everyone. So my point is not just that Supreme Court opinions can change the law and our system says, well, sometimes we go with it. What I'm saying is sometimes those Supreme Court opinions are accurately, correctly capturing what the law is, not because I think the justices have some sort of power to change the law, but because they could be responding to changes in the law that have occurred at a more fundamental level. Uh, I'll also say that it's true that what I said was originalism is not something that Randy said in his opening remarks. That's why you'll recall I said I'm going to quibble a bit with what he said. But it's not the case that he had never said it. Uh, if I had my, I read it, wrote some, out, some remarks out before I you know, gave them orally. But I will uh, draw your attention to the relevant passage in, I think, your 2013 article, where you speak not only about the meaning of the text, but the law. I could also give you quotations from the great late Justice Scalia and Stephen Calabresi, the founder of the, of the uh, Federalist Society and one of the most important conservative legal thinkers of our lifetimes, that makes clear as could be the claim is not just a claim about the meaning of the text, but rather is a claim about the relationship between the meaning of the text and what ultimately lawyers care about, which is a different type of entity. Law, not merely meaning. One, the last thing I'll say about this is one way to think about it is non-originalists like me could agree that the meaning of the text doesn't change, in which case we wouldn't have a disagreement with him. What we're saying is fine. The meaning of the text is the same, but what we care about in terms of whether we're, if we're lawyers or if we're judges, 
And for citizens, what we care mostly about is what the law is or should be, or, or should be understood to be, not merely what the meaning is, if there isn't that tight relationship that I was attributing to originalism between meaning and law. If one were to say, the meaning stays the same, but oh, yeah, the relationship between the meaning and what the law is rightly understood is very different, then we're already in my space. Do you want to speak to the Loving versus Virginia question? Is it something you want to? I, I think it would, be, it would be problematic to try to go through each and every yeah, example yeah, yeah. and show you know, how that result could be, in fact, should be reached on originalist grounds, because it would go to the original meaning of the 14th Amendment. It would go to the original meaning of the due process of law, yeah. as opposed to the equal protection of the law, as well as privileges, the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, and, what that, and, and the kinds of duties that imposes on states uh, as well, and it's just too complicated uh, to do here under these circumstances. Maybe a good question, um, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, which Supreme Court justice on the current court best reflects your view about how the Constitution should be interpreted, and can you point us to a case that he or she has written, either a dissent or a majority opinion in, that nicely illustrates that? You want to start there? You didn't tell us you were going to ask that question. <laughs> this, 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 was, this wasn't on your list of questions for us to think about. Okay, I've, I'm going to resist the question just a little bit, but in a way that I hope Michael will think is nonetheless respectful of the question. See, this is how it's done, folks. <laughs> I'm going to give a justice. This, this is how who, it's done. I am going to give a justice who is not presently on the court but was very recently. Is that nonetheless a friendly type of response? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Justice Kennedy. I actually, I am probably the academic who has written the nicest words about Justice Kennedy of anyone. I wrote an article called Justice Kennedy, Our Principal Justice, maybe that wasn't that, maybe Anthony Kennedy, Our Principal Justice, something like that. It wasn't a great title, like none of my stuff is great, but, uh, <laughs> but it, was a big, it was a big wet kiss to Justice Kennedy. Why? Because I think actually his view is exactly the right, well, it's not exactly the right view, because you know, he he's not a theorist. He doesn't have to be, he's a justice. So he had a glimmer, a glimpse to the right view, and his view is one of principles matter. Any lawyers in this room well, no, I'm exactly right about that. He's a principal guy. Principles, 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 principles. And he's pluralist. He's not like Scalia or Thomas. There's one thing that matters. Lots of things. Now, there were principles that he liked better than others. So, my goodness, did that man love principles of freedom of expression, right? But you also know, and maybe not everyone's going to love this in the room, you know that he loved principles of human dignity, right? So, he all of his decisions were based on what he took to be our constitutional principles. And he also recognized, although I acknowledge this was a more minor note in his jurisprudence, but it was there, that these principles are not fixed at one moment in time. Our constitutional order depends upon the principles of our constitutional system. And those arise through a complex interchange among citizens and elected officials and judges uh, over time. So, I actually, I don't love, frankly, the jurisprudence of any member of the present court. Uh, I've got critical things to say about those on the left and those on the right. I don't love Thomas, I don't love Breyer. But Justice Kennedy, I think, had it close to right. He understood that the system depends upon a plurality of principles and they evolve in organic fashion, just like all human phenomena inescapably evolve organically. Um, I'm tempted to say some stuff about Justice Kennedy, um, who's, who's not going to be my pick, you'll be surprised to know. Um, I, I argued in front of Justice Kennedy. I argued the medical marijuana case of Gonzalez versus Raich, in which I was trying to convince the four conservative justices who had decided a previous case called Lopez um, that was beyond the federal power to reach, uh, to regulate commerce among the several states to tell my client, Angel Raich, um, that she could not grow marijuana um, uh, on her own property. Actually, in, she, in her case, she had caregivers growing it for her. But my other client, Diane Monson, was growing marijuana on her own property to consume herself. And somehow, that came under the power of, the, of Congress's power to regulate commerce among the several states. Um, and um, they had previously ruled in this Lopez case, which I want to say a little bit about, uh, that, 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 that 
that clause had limits, um, and I was arguing to them that this exceeded that limits, and I knew I wouldn't get the progressive judges I would at all, but to win the case, I had to get the four conservative justices, including Justice Kennedy. So guess what? I didn't get Justice Kennedy. Um, I, and you know he was actually quite visibly hostile to me during open ar uh, or, oral argument, which he normally isn't. He's normally very genial. He's a genial guy. He was genial on the bench, but he wasn't genial to me that day. I also lost Justice Scalia as well. I didn't get his vote either. So who did I get? I got Thomas, Rehnquist, and O'Connor. That's who I got. Well, why did I lose Justice Kennedy? Nobody knows because he didn't actually have an opinion in the case. Um, but we d subsequently learned that his brother um, had a serious drug issue. Um, and the drug issue was a thing for him. Um, and also, um, he was chosen, as we, I, we, we remembered, uh, as a replacement uh, for Robert Bork, who is, whose nomination went down. But then after Bork was nominated, Gin Justice Gin Judge Ginsburg was nominated, and his nomination went down because he had actually smoked marijuana at Harvard Law School. And so the Reagan administration came up with another pick and I think they found somebody who was kind of sound on the drug issue, and they found Justice Kennedy to take that spot. And so that may explain why we, we, he didn't write an opinion, so we can't be sure, but that may explain his visceral hostility to me uh, that day in the courtroom. So my thing about Justice Kennedy is, well, that's a great judge. You'll know what he thinks when he tells you. <laughs> You're not going to know what he thinks unless he tells you, but then you'll find out. Eventually, you'll find out what he thinks. Now, that to me is not necessarily a judge that you want to emulate. I tend to agree with Mitch. None of the, judge, none of the justices in our history have, have really been my heroes, let's say. But if I had to pick a member of the current court or recent court, um, at this point, I would have to say it was Justice Thomas, even though I disagree with some of the stuff. I, have to, I hasten to say I don't agree with everything Justice Thomas has said or done. But he, I think, is the best one. And as illustrated, A, by the fact that in the Lopez case, which is a case I talked about, he did an originalist understanding of the meaning of commerce, which I subsequently did scholarship to see if he was right or not about, and I think he, I've shown that he was correct, that commerce had a more limited meaning than it currently has been given, um, and that, in fact, um, this case would be beyond the commerce power to reach. Uh, both the Lopez case, which was the, about the Gun-Free School Zone Act, which five justices said was beyond the power of, of Congress to reach, but only Justice Thomas had an opinion on originalist grounds. The other four did not have an opinion on originalist grounds. So that's why I single him out. And then in our case, um, uh, there's no reason to believe that Justice Thomas is a big fan of marijuana or anything, or medical marijuana, but we got his vote, uh, I think, as a matter of principle, because he thought that telling somebody what plant they could grow in their own garden to consume themselves was beyond the interstate mm -hmm. commerce power of Congress. And so that's, that's who my pick would be. So here's a question. Uh, that coincidentally, is, is from an audience member, but I did say in advance I, I might ask about, and that is, uh, well, maybe we'll start with you, Randy, since I know this is something you've thought about, and then Mitch can respond. Uh, applying your definition of originalism, why isn't the right to keep and bear arms under the Second Amendment delimited by reference to maintenance of a well-regulated militia? Why, in the case, of course, is D.C. versus Heller, in which the court held that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to bear arms subject to reasonable regulation, but this question is saying, why on the originalist grounds doesn't the right to keep bear arms, why isn't it limited by reference to the maintenance of a well-regulated militia? Well, okay. Um, first of all, because the prefatory clause, which states the purpose, uh, a purpose, of that particular individual right that the operative clause refers to, uh, doesn't necessarily limit the operative clause. Uh, prefatory clauses don't have that necessary feature. But let me just say that even if it did, uh, even if it somehow affected the scope of the right, it really wouldn't matter because of the meaning of what the militia was. The militia that it refers to is the general militia, which is not the same thing as a select militia. A select militia is, is, are the individuals who are chosen and are currently serving in militia service. Um, they, it is the functional equivalent of the National Guard today would be the select militia. But the general militia was the body politic. The militia was pretty much everybody, although it was generally males. Um, but everybody capable of bearing arms was in the militia. Um, and so the individual right to keep and bear arms is not really constrained much uh, by the idea that it, the, it was a means to the protection of the well-regulated militia. And why was it? An, why, why did they choose an individual right to keep and bear arms 
as a means of ensuring uh, the preservation of a well-regulated militia because they couldn't just give a mandate and say, okay, Congress shall not do X because that wouldn't necessarily work. What they decided is, is that the way that the militia has been undermined by governments in the past is by taking away the guns of the people. And the way to keep, preserve the existence of the militia um, uh, is to maintain the guns in private hands. That's, that's, the militia all had guns in private hands. The last thing I will say is that my definition of the militia that I just offered you, the general militia, it's still in United States law. In the United States Code, uh, distinguishes as a matter of positive law, so Mitch is going to love this one. Um, it's a matter of positive <laughs> law by statute. There are two militias defined in the United States Code. One is um, the... Um, the militia that is the organized militia, and that is the equivalent in the code of the, of the National Guard. And the other is what it's, it, it's called the unorganized militia. And the unorganized militia is the equivalent of the general militia I was just talking about. And in the code, it is defined as males, I should say, which I think is subject to constitutional challenge. Um, but it's males between certain ages and other ages. I'm outside, I've aged out of the militia <laughs> under the code, even though I do, have a, well, I do own a firearm myself, more than one. Um, so um, uh, that's what I would say. That uh, it, it's it's a, I just have to say that this is a very complicated subject, um, and I did the best I could to try to give you a short, pithy answer to what is actually a very difficult question to answer in a short and pithy way. Just uh, playing off the last thing Randy said, the nature of law is a complicated question too. You know, so the fact that. The, what I think is the right account is not the sort of thing you could put on a bumper sticker. One might expect the right account, whether it's mine or someone else's, is going to have that nature. It's sort of complicated. That being said, getting to the question about Heller, uh, what Randy said is very interesting, but it's not exactly what Justice Scalia said in the Heller opinion. He did not think that the preferatory clause did not uh, tend to contradict the individual right that he found to be in the Second Amendment. Rather, he reasoned that a preferatory clause under original methods of interpretation would have effect only if there were any ambiguity with respect to the operative clause. So then he looked into the history and said, there is no doubt at all. Does this sound like Justice Scalia? There is no doubt at all, clear as could be, that the history suggests that the, uh, that the right to bear arms was an individual right. Once he, made, once he contended that this was cut and dried as a historical matter, then he could conveniently push aside the prefatory clause, and he said it would have no effect because the canons of interpretation said it only had effect if there's an ambiguity. I don't think that was his finest moment, and I think Justice Alito was far more candid in the subsequent McDonald case when he said, historians tell us that actually it's somewhat of a complicated matter. It's not so clear what the original understanding of the right to uh, keep and bear arms in the late 18th century was. That said, I'm actually quite supportive of the bottom line result that's reached in the Heller case. I do think that based on the principles of our order as they have developed, uh, there is a personal right to keep and bear arms. So I think that that's basically the right result. However, the full content of the Heller decision is actually much more supportive of my view than uh, of, what, of constitutional law than of the simple-minded originalist view. Not to suggest Randy's view is simple-minded. There's nothing simple-minded about, about Randy Barnett. Um, why do I say that? Because those of you who've read the opinion or read uh, news reports about it, might recall an interesting feature of it. When he says, not, after Justice Scalia uh, spends a lot of time going through the history, showing that there's an individual right, and the text says uh, uh, Congress shall pass no laws infringing the right to bear arms. He says, but nothing about this should undermine the longstanding practices of prohibiting people from owning firearms if they're felons or if they're mentally incompetent or regulating the possession of firearms in special vulnerable buildings, etc. To which one might say, well, that looks like an infringement to me. What makes that permissible? Well, the answer is, of course that's permissible. We all know that's got to be permissible. Why? Because part of our principles of law is we're not doing crazy stuff. 
The, the principle of non-absurdity, non-wacky results is also built into a law. And we all just sort of know in our bones that Congress or, and the states have got to be able to pass laws which say if you are certifiably crazy, you can't bring a gun into the courthouse, right? But that's something we know, not because we've, uh, we've excavated the 18th century history and then we can point to some sort of proof text which shows, yep, that's what they meant and understood then. We know it because we have an understanding of what our principles and norms are and what our legal system is like and what the fundamental commitments are as they have evolved. So I think actually finding an individual right to keep and bear arms is proper, partly based on historical grounds, which matter for an organic pluralist, but they're not the only things that matter, partly because of principles of liberty that people who care about liberty have done a whole lot to help bolster over time. Uh, but the full contours of that opinion actually are a nice nod to organic pluralism over originalism. So I just wanted to tell everybody that if you, have, if you don't know what the Heller and McDonald cases are about, um, you get this book that you're going to get for free. And chapter 60 and 61, corresponding to video 60 and 61, will tell you all about the Heller and McDonald cases. And I just want to point out that on the inside cover is a scratch-off code and this scratch-off code is what gives you access to the 63 video series. So otherwise, I don't want you to miss out on that because we spent two years and $100,000 making these videos. And the, and the post-production work was done by my co-author with all, we have pictures, we have, we have diagrams, we have excerpts from oral argument. Um, so, and I'm, I'm selling this to an audience that's getting it for free, I want you to know. I know. So I, know. I just want you to know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. we're, we're at the end of our time. One last question. Mitch, you uh, are an expert on, as you call it, the jurisprudence of sport, infield fly rule, pine targeting, all that kind of stuff. From the audience, should the Houston Astros be forced to give up their World <laughs> Series title? <laughs> Given that I've sold myself as an expert in this, I really should have an answer. <laughs> I think that's a discretionary judgment by the commissioner. It doesn't matter a whole lot to me. What does matter to me is the fact that we understand it's cheating, that it's not okay to price all the rules, to treat all the rules of an enterprise like the Holmesian bad man. Something prohibits something, and you just treat it as though it's a priced option. Oh, what that, that prohibition means, I can do it, but I may have to pay a price. What I like about the response to the Astros scandal, and I like the fact that the players are not giving them a free pass, is to bolster the idea that rules matter. And if you're prohibited from doing something, you live up to that. What makes it the case, though, that actually that particular example, what they did there, is cheating, as opposed to a huge number of examples from sport in which tactical rule violations are entirely permitted, right? In, Lots of sports people are violating the rules all the time, and we don't think that's cheating. What makes it the case that this was not merely a rule violation but cheating? You know my answer to that. That is a function of what the norms of the practice have been over time. It has been different over time, could be different in the future, and is different from one rule governed system to another. So that's resisting the question a little bit, but if you want a quick answer, yeah, they should probably forfeit it, the sons <laughs> of the guns. <laughs> well, please join me in thanking our Two panelists. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Randy. That was fun. Um, Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, we really appreciate your canter, your, your candor, your intellect, and your goodwill. And we hope to have you all back at a Liberty Series program soon. Thank you very much. Our next program will be on March 2nd. And again, there are books back here. Please make sure you get one on your way out. Thank you very much. You get two. That's right. That was great.